Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. The Red Angus breed continues to grow in numbers and influence. Why? It's because of the quality cattle and the hardworking folks who produce them. Red Angus females are known as the beef industry's most favored female and have dominated the market for more than a decade. According to Superior Livestock data, Red Angus heifers command a $92 premium per head compared to all other breeds. The longevity, efficiency, and calm disposition of Red Angus females make them the ideal cow for today's producer. To explore opportunities through the Red Angus breed, visit redangus.org. Hey folks, it is Shay Warner here, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are going to be visiting with Kiernan Brandt about bull selection criteria. So Kiernan was raised in Wyoming, where he fell in love with cattle production and the ag lifestyle. He studied heifer development and reproductive physiology at the University of Tennessee, and he was receiving his master's there when he did that. He spent three years with producers as an extension field specialist for SDSU, so that's South Dakota State University, and he did that to improve and streamline the cattle operations. Um, Currently, he works as a professional service technician for Transova Genetics, and he's really helping propagate some of the best cattle genetics in the world with advanced reproductive technology. So with Kiernan being very passionate about genetics and having experience helping producers, I thought he would be a great fit to visit with myself and help you as a listener um, better be better prepare yourself really for the upcoming bull sale season. So with that, let's dive in and visit with Kiernan. Before we do that, I do want to remind you that if you have increasing your profits or creating another source of revenue for your ranch on your goal for 2024, check out Land Trust. It's a great organization or a business that helps you as a landowner get paid for hunters, recreationists, whatever it may be for entering on your land. They make it easy for you. They still allow you to have full control of the land. They're really doing great things for rural communities too. So there's a link for that. They save you a lot of time with setting up these enterprises. So there's a link for that in the show notes. Go check that out. But with that, let's hear from Kiernan. All right. Well, good morning, Kiernan. I'm glad you could join me for this conversation. Uh, this episode, it'll be going out in January, but it's uh, it's been a pretty nice December for me up in North Dakota. So thanks for hopping on today. Yeah, absolutely. We've kind of been blessed with a, with a little bit of an extended fall. Winter's just kind of started showing her head. Hopefully it, I don't know, we're supposed to get back into the, the low 40s, mid 40s this week. So yeah, kind of weird fall. Yeah, absolutely. And so I know I, before this, I read through your bio and kind of introduced yourself to the listeners and the intro, but just, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, yourself in your own words. So kind of where are you at right now and what are you doing for the beef industry? Sure. So, um, a little bit, I guess, differently than most, I actually don't come from an agricultural background. I am about one generation removed on both sides of my family. But, um, you know, grew up outdoors, grew up hunting and fishing and and exploring a lot of um, a lot of areas that tie closely together with agriculture. You know, I'm from Wyoming, so there's a ton of uh, public land utilization out there where outdoorsmen can really enjoy um, enjoy those spaces alongside grazing leases and different things like that. And so, from a pretty early age, you know, I was blessed to have some really good um, resources and mentors um, that kind of just fell into place and introduced me to, to agriculture and FFA and different programs like that. And that got me got me interested and involved. And, you know, I always um, kind of look at things through a um, through a, a, a symbiotic relationship with with Mother Nature and um you know, fitting in with in environment. And that's something you'll hear me talk about a ton, um, especially mm-hmm. on a topic like this. Um, but, you know, just just based on where I come from and and seeing seeing how things tie together with nature and, and how we as cattle producers now and in my current role can, you know, how we can use that rather than fight against it. Because if you fight against mother nature, nine times out of 10, you're either going to spend way too much money or you're just going to flat out lose. So, um, you know, I, I, 
went to grad school for reproductive physiology and got a master's degree. Um, we looked specifically at, at heifer development and kind of developing some strategies that we could put in place through diet and supplementation when they were getting when they were getting raised after weaning to when we bred them that first time around to uh, you know try and try and simplify things for, from a producer standpoint to maximize conception rates and um, keep those heifers around for a long time and not get them too fat. And, uh, you know, from there I went, went to work for South Dakota state university and spent three good years. Um, got back to the, got back, not quite the West, but the Midwest and mm -hmm. um, got to work with some phenomenal producers in that area and um, developed a lot of relationships that I still place really high emphasis on and still stay in close contact with and, and help out from, from a technical standpoint, whenever I get the opportunity. Um, and yeah, just, just here recently in the past few months, I've, I've switched up my roles to um, a little bit more, a little bit more on farm based, a little bit more cow time. Um, I now work for Transova Genetics. I'm a professional services technician and, you know, spend, spend my days in a cow and trying to, try and identify those premier females and, and work with, uh, work with cattle producers across the country to, to help get those genetics, speed up that genetic interval and, and get more of those, um, get more of those genetics out there. So. Well, I, I always appreciate the perspective of someone who doesn't come from an immediate ag background who's on the show, because there's definitely a different, view and perspective about our industry that I think is very valuable. And that's something I even said when I was in college, I'd have friends and they'd say, oh, well, I just, I don't know. I mean, they'd second guess everything because they were an animal science major. They were focusing on beef cattle. They didn't come from the background. And I was like, actually, you look at everything with a way clearer picture than I ever will. Cause I'm five generations in. So I've got some biases to break and maybe some bad habits and all that stuff. So I always appreciate those perspectives. Yeah, that that inherent bias is, uh, you know, that's just something that that happens, and it's not necessarily a a good thing or a bad thing. It's just um, I always say that's one of the most dangerous things that a cattle producer can a mentality that they can develop is you know this is the way we've always done it or this is the you know we do it this way because grandpa did it this way and um, you know sometimes it would be nice to have those mentors coming from a from a generational you know generational operation, but at the same time, I, I don't have any bad habits that at least that I know of, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> I do, but, um, you know, I'm, I consider myself a lifelong learner. I'm the reason that I'm so happy in this, in this position and in this industry is that there's always things that you can, there's always things that you can learn. And, uh, you know, that's something I try to challenge myself to do all the time is just to, to seek out those things and try to become, become more aware of them and, and how to use those, um, use those things to your advantage. Well, awesome. So, you know, you are, you got your master's focused kind of on repro and right now you're in the genetic space. So what has really kind of drawn you to that repro genetic side of the industry? So I guess to make a really long story short, when I was just first starting out, we, um, we had the privilege in my home County of being able to use a school farm and I started running grass heifers out there. Uh, it wasn't being used a whole lot at the time, at least some of the larger pastures. Um, it was mostly based on 4-H animals. And, um, you know, just with my background, that was something that I never really had the opportunity to um, dive into as deep as maybe I would have wanted to. Um, you know, that, that can get, that can become a really expensive hobby really fast. And so I took a more practical approach, um, just with, you know, trying to live within my means. And we started running some heifers on grass and utilizing a resource that was there and trying to, you know, experiment with how, how we could learn and develop and maybe make a little bit of money at the same time. And, um, at the end of that first summer, there was some heifers that we held back that I decided would make some really good replacement heifers. And, uh, you know, as a, 16, 17 year old kid, I went to the bank and the bank told me, no, absolutely not. We're not going to loan you money for a bull. You're a, you know, you, <laughs> you don't really have the means to be playing this game, which was, you know, absolutely correct. But, uh, I'm one of those people that I don't really like being told no. And I'll usually just find a way to get it done on my own. So I, um, not long after that, I, I took a class in junior college and learned how to breed cows. And, uh, you know, I, I just fell in love with it. And, and, uh, 
you know, how, how someone like me that doesn't really have the means to go out and purchase these high dollar genetics can, mm -hmm. can find a way to use them um, almost immediately and to, to reap the successes that, that they almost always offer and to use, utilize some of those advanced reproductive systems to, to help to optimize your herd, whether it's, you know, where I, what I was doing at the time with four or five animals to these larger operations now that sometime are a thousand head plus that I get to work with. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, it's really cool. I've always had kind of that science bug and, um, the genetics has always just come. Um, I wouldn't say it, it came naturally to me. I was almost funneled into it when I started with SDSU, we had a lot of reproductive physiologists on staff at the time. And that was just a really good, a really good niche for me coming out of grad school to kind of sink my teeth into. And, um, you know, I love it. The data, you know, it's not EPDs and, and data and, and the stuff like that. It's not always perfect, but, um, it's, it's a tool and it's something that we as producers can utilize in a very constructive way, in a very immediate way to kind of help push that genetic progress needle in whatever direction we're trying to move it. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, so kind of diving into the topic, you know, as we look at producers, especially in kind of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Midwest in general, they're kind of entering calving season or will be in a few months anyways a lot of producers you should be careful saying that I know a lot of people shifting back towards May and June too for good reasons but you know it's also and that calving season time and bull sale season is basically here and so what do cattle producers need to kind of be asking themselves now as they're in you know this will be coming out in January what questions do they need to be asking themselves as they're considering you know what type of bull do i need this next breeding season i think a great place to start is you know not only to to go out and look at you know how things are going as you're starting to calve um you know how are those things how are those things going but also to take a look back at the past year and see what went right last year, what maybe could have been improved, um, and to take just a really good, honest look at the cow herd and to, you know, throw throw outside opinions out the window because a lot of times producers are the ones that are seeing these animals every day. I mean, they're always the ones seeing these animals every day. And, um, you know, it can be really easy, I think, especially in recent years. I I mean, I've noticed it just in my short career within the industry, but um, the marketing behind a lot of these um, genetics companies and, um, you know, different, different segments of the interest of the industry has gotten so progressive. And so the volume of it has increased so much, not that that's not that that's bad by any means, but, um, I think a lot of times, you know, we're, we're, we're human beings and we can be biased a little bit by outside information. I think a lot of times we can learn a little bit more and have a little better game plan before we ever start thinking about what sales we're going to, or things like that, by just, reflecting a little bit and having an honest conversation with ourselves and, and taking a really close look at, at what went well, what maybe didn't go so hot and things that we'd really like to like to improve within the cow herd from a, you know, from a labor management standpoint, from, from really every segment. I mean, whether that's calving, which, you know, as you mentioned, will be going on a little bit heavier, especially across those seed stock operations, but um, also in the last year of the calf crop, you know, was the, cause at that point, you know, most of the calves will be weaned. We'll have a pretty decent idea if they're in a backgrounding phase or in a, you know, in a development lot, you're going to have a little bit better idea of what maybe their, their post weaning growth potential is. And um, just kind of taking a, a good, hard, honest look, looking back at the feed bills from the last year and and seeing, you know, is this, is this something that's manageable? You know, we're in an era of rapidly increasing input costs all the time. And I don't see that really steadying out anytime soon. And, um, you know, just kind of getting an, a good, honest pulse of where the cow herd is at and maybe things that we would like to improve and make a little easier or things that went great. And we, we, we love it and we want to replicate it one more time. Yeah. I, so the input cost and feeding side, that's I'm glad you brought that up because a few episodes back, I had Aaron Berger on the show and we talked about um, trying to reduce some feed costs and whatnot. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, well, you know, it worked for grandpa. And that's kind of something Aaron said, it said economically, it might've worked for grandpa to feed that way, but anymore, that doesn't mean it's economically going to work for you to feed that way. And so I think, 
you know, this whole conversation about environment is important. And, you know, that was a great conversation about environment and feeding, but what about environment and bull selection? Because you brought that up at the beginning that you like to see how cattle operations and nature can work symbiotically and that, you know, environment is an important factor. So can you touch a little bit about the importance of understanding your environment and resources before you start going out and buying bulls? or even yeah. selecting semen for what you're going to breed your herd to. Sure. Absolutely. No, I, I already caught myself in a little bit of a fib. I said, I didn't have any bias, but you're going to hear a little bit of my bias right now. And that's, you know, I just based on where I come from, um, you know, in my, in my home County, it takes about 30 acres to make one animal units worth of feed. Um, it's, it's a, and maybe that wasn't the case this last year because Laramie County finally got rain and the Western Plains actually got quite a bit of moisture. But historically speaking, you know, a very barren, um, a very barren type of landscape. Um, and the sagebrush country is really good at speeding up the rate at which you force your cow herd to, to fit its environment. And it does that by keeping cows that are too big, um, it forces them to fall out of the herd, you know, cows that can't cut it in a low input style system. Um, they don't last. And that's something that's always stuck with me. Um, you know, I'm very much of the opinion that that cows should work for the cattlemen and not necessarily so much the other way around, especially in the modern world where a lot of people have other jobs and other enterprises and a lot of other things going on. The more, the more well suited you can have um, the majority of the cow herd just able to, to kind of do it on their own with a with a simplistic management style. Um, I think the better off better off the cows will be in the long term, the better off the the downstream payouts are going to be and uh, the better off the, the mental health of the operation is going to be rather than spending all of your time in a tractor feeding and and trying to find supplement and, and things like that. And, you know, one way that I really like to help producers kind of hone in on that is through um, and with, with, with their bull selection is, you know, and genetic selection is to, to really reflect on what the mature size of that cow herd is. Um, and if, if they really need to be that big, um, I was having this conversation the other day with a, with a coworker and, you know, I think we live in some of the best cattle producing country in the world. And while that presents a lot of opportunities, I think that can also um, that can also kind of crutch up a lot of a lot of people and a lot of cattle at some points uh, because they don't have to necessarily work as hard um, as they would in a low input sagebrush predominant environment. And so, um, cattle with with poor feet that don't get around maybe as well as they could or should. Um, cows that are too big and aren't maybe as efficient in their environment is, uh, is something that I notice, um, uh, pretty predominantly still in this part of the world. And, you know, uh, a really good indicator for me is what percentage of a mature cow's body weight is she weaning off every year? And, you know, you like to see that number as high as it could possibly be. I don't think there's anyone that would argue with how pretty it is when you've got a, a cow out on out on the pasture that hasn't been fed any supplement all year the calf hasn't had any creep and he's already starting to kind of edge up towards his mama's top line when you get close to weaning i mean that's a really pretty sight and that's really lets you know that that you're doing a lot of things well um and so really you know managing managing the mature size of these females through the genetics that we're implementing through the replacement efforts that we're buying and just making sure that they really line up with with what's going to fit our environment, what's going to fit our feed base. That's something that I really try to focus on. Um, you know, the, the talk of the industry for the past 10, 20 years has been, you know, improved performance, improved growth, improve, you know, but the, the downstream effects of that are that, you know, we can really ramp up mature cow size in a hurry. We can really ramp up the, the amount of additional feed costs and inputs that we're going to have to put into those. And so it's, you know, it's a teeter totter. It's definitely a balancing act, but, um, you know, maybe trying to find those more moderate frame score animals, uh, if that's what your operation is telling you that you need that don't necessarily sacrifice the, the pre weaning post weaning and feedlot performance at the same time, you know, taking it one step further beyond, yeah, we've got a, we've got a bull and some genetics that, uh, we know are going to add pounds, but doing it 
doing it in a way that adds smart pounds, if that makes sense. So, you know, frame score, that's something that kind of gets brought up, especially when I talk to people who are intensively grazing and whatnot, they relate frame score to being more efficient. Is that necessarily true that your smaller, more moderate frame scores are going to inherently be more feed efficient? And I ask because one of my first cows was a very moderate cow, but she was always eating. She was always at the feed bunk and you look at the genetic space too. So is that just because they're more moderate, does that inherently mean they're going to be more efficient? I would say, you know, as, as a rule of thumb, you know, the smaller that the smaller that you make those mature cows, the the less feed they'll consume on average, just as a percentage of body weight mm -hmm. across the board. Does that necessarily mean that you can't identify specific cow families or sire families that to kind of take that to the next step within itself and are exceptionally feed efficient within that environment? Um, you absolutely can. And I think that's one of the things I'm most excited to see the industry kind of push on and progress is, you know, it's the same thing as a human, a human being's metabolism, you know, not, not all of them are created equally. Um, and we've developed these, you know, we've developed these body weight percentage equivalents of what a cow will eat, but there cer certainly is individual variation on from one animal to another, to another, and, you know, specific cow families, specific lineages that just do well um and convert better they might eat less because yeah there's there's absolutely some moderate some more moderate animals out there that are just they're hogs they find the feed bunk and they they live there um and that's you know that's that's just one of those things that if you can do if you can do one one of those things and start maybe to to moderate mature cow size as a general rule of thumb to increase that percentage of of calf being weaned off every year that's great but if you can take that to the next step and start to take a deeper dive through some of these technologies that we have available to start maybe calculating some feed efficiencies and taking a good look at those, um, you know, whether that's a grow safe program or a, a genomic analysis or any one of those tools that we we have coming online and that are getting better by the day. I think that's just that's going to pay dividends in the long term, because I really think that's where the industry is headed. Increased profitability and informed management decisions go hand in hand. Herd Dog is a data analytics company that makes it possible for cattle producers to collect herd information efficiently. Their smart ear tag monitors cattle 24 7. Think of it as a Fitbit for cattle. Herd Dog fits the needs of a variety of operations as it can find sick animals days before humans can detect illness, and it also identifies which cows are in heat. Best of all, the tags have a high visibility light to help you sort out which cattle you are looking for. Head to their website, which is linked in the show notes, or contact them for a consultation to see how Herd Dog can work for you. Herd Dog is spelled H E R D D O G G. That's two D's and two G's. So you use the word smart pound, you know, adding smart pounds. Can you kind of define that a little more and what producers can be looking at? I mean, you just talked about, you know, grow safe units, some of that stuff, but like for that typical commercial cattleman, what can they be looking at to kind of figure out how they can add on those smart pounds? Sure. Um, well, you know, a, a really good example that pops into my brain is like what the, the bulls that we're exposing to, to our replacement efforts, you know, for years and years and years, it was, um, it was the industry standard and the industry goal just to get a live calf out of those heifers. And if you were doing that on a high percentage basis, you were succeeding. And I think now, the, the data behind a lot of these animals has gotten so good and, you know, expected progeny differences and really um, moderating birth weight and, cal and you know, trying to select for a little bit of calving ease and, and cows that, that have calves on their own. We can take that one step further and not, uh, not only get a live calf out of replacement heifers, but expose them to a bull that's going to not only produce a live calf, but then pack in some, some additional pre-weaning and post-weaning growth potential there as well. Um, you know, without the need to add an additional cost like creep feed. And so finding, finding these cattle and, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody listening has heard the term curve bender, um, finding those, those curve bender type animals that have the capability to produce live calves without a whole lot of problems, um, close to zero or maybe even a tad negative birth weight, high percentage calving ease, 
that still don't sacrifice that um, those those metrics where commercial cattlemen actually get paid without the need for you know without the need for additional inputs. Um, trying to maximize those and not necessarily maximize, but find finding a finding a balance of what your environment is going to provide for you and and trying to work towards um, making that the most efficient that it can be. And that's that's what I meant when I said smart pounds is, you know, trying to trying to improve things and trying to, you know, we're, we're always trying to make things better and to push that needle, um, try to increase the, the average weaning weight from last year, but um, doing it in a way that makes sense through through genetic selection through listening to what the cows are telling you that they, they might need in a complimentary mating decision without having to give, give them a crutch, like, like more creep feed or, or implementing creep feed in the first place. I think, um, you know, I, 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 it might, it might work some years and then some years it might not work nearly as well. And so if you, enable, you know, if you, if you prop up those calves and, and decide that this is what we have to do to make them weigh this, I think that puts you in a little bit of a box and it doesn't provide you necessarily the flexibility that someone coming from the other end of the spectrum might have. So what can producers do to work towards finding that balance between selecting bulls off of phenotype and genotype? Well, you know, I, we, when I was at SDSU, we taught a lot of AI schools and I got the pleasure of discussing a lot of these topics with those students. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a pie chart. And I don't think anyone necessarily has the same pie chart in their brain, but, um, you know, just kind of dividing the sections of that pie chart into phenotype, genotype, um, and everyone's going to put a little bit more emphasis on different segments of that. But I think at the end of the day, most producers like having bulls in the pasture that they enjoy looking at. Um, you know, sure. There's, there's absolutely some bargain hunters out there that um, as long as it'll make a cow pregnant, if we can get it by, bought for the right amount of money, it's good enough. Um, but I think that's a really old school way of, of looking at things nowadays. Um, and you really do have to kind of take a deeper dive and find a way to balance out both. Um, you know, whether it's um, nature versus nurture, you know, some things like that. Finding finding a cow, finding a bull that um, comes from a cow family that really fits in phenotypically with your environment through mature size, expected mature size if you're buying yearling bulls. Um, and then also has a complementary set of data behind it and EPDs that that really kind of fits in with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can look at that, but um, you know, for me, identifying identifying those operations if you're purchasing bulls or even even if you're AIing, um, identifying where these sires came from, the cow families behind them. Um, the environments that they're raised in, that's a really, really good way to kind of hone in on whether or not those genetics are going to be um, compatible with your operation is, you know, taking a deeper dive and looking at how they have to run the remainder of the year. Um, I don't think there's any argument across the industry that that yearling bulls a lot of times are a little bit over conditioned. And uh, I won't name names, but I've, you know, had conversations with purebred producers who said the only thing that people like more than a than a fat bull is a fatter bull and you know it's just one of those things that um it's just one of those things that i don't necessarily sure if, if they're too fat that can sacrifice a little bit of long-term capability and long-term competence from a breeding standpoint but you know the industry is moving towards developing developing bulls um a specific way and a lot of times they're a little too a little too fleshy in my opinion but at the same time, their moms probably aren't. The majority of the cow herd where they came from probably isn't. And so the more that you can understand about how those seed stock producers are developing and raising those animals and what's going into their their production mentality and matching that up with yours, um, you know, that's really going to pay dividends down the road. That that just sets them up to be more naturally adapted from the moment they step off the trailer. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than spending ten thousand dollars on a bull and then having him only cover a handful of cows um 
And the more homework that you can do on the front end ahead of that, I think, um, you know, from a phenotype and from a data standpoint, that's a, that's a great way to kind of get started. And then, you know, taking a look at, again, just lining up those, lining up those characteristics of what your cow herd might need. If they're getting a little bit too long in the tor in their spine and in their, in their body length, then, you know, trying to identify phenotypically things that we can do to correct um, some of that stuff that maybe will help um, improve their offspring compared to themselves. And then, you know, at the same time, balancing that with, with a nice data profile that, that kind of matches up what you're trying to do long-term. So what about the age of the bulls when you're looking at, you know, what type of bull should I buy? When would, you know, producers know if, you know, yearlings are going to work or should they look at an 18 month to two year old bull? What are some factors to consider there? You know, I'm, Again, maybe this is a little bit of my bias, but I'm I'm a really big fan of older bulls. And I will say that with one caveat. I I think there are producers operating in the purebred space that maybe have kind of developed a bad habit of using um using the bulls that weren't big enough or attractive enough when they were a year old and rolling them into a 18 month to two year old bull sale program. And you know, they've they've got a business to run and uh and things that they have to do to you know, to, to stay in the black, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think that's a recipe for long-term success for the people purchasing those animals. Um, are, is, is it going to be absolutely detri detrimental? Probably not, but it's not necessarily the same as purchasing from someone who has made a, a pretty largeable, a large, you know, a large investment into developing that 18 month to two year old mature bull sale. Um, if that makes sense, there's just a little bit of difference there in mentality and philosophy. Um, because you know, the, the older a bull gets, the, the more cows are going to be capable of servicing, the more you're going to know about their mature size, their feed performance, their, you know, a lot of these reproductive characteristics, they're going to have more chance to kind of come off of that fat yearling bull stage and, you know, slim down a little bit, develop a little more, you're going to get a better look at what they're going to look like long-term. And then at the same time, you know, if, uh, if those producers that are raising those animals are doing a, doing a good job, they're going to have a lot more data to provide you with those animals, which I think is super beneficial. Um, especially if they believe in the bulls that they're developing and are sampling them on heifers as yearlings, getting them collected and, and AIing back to them, that's just going to bolster their, their data predictions. That's just going to make that variation that possible variation decrease, which is something that's huge in that space. Uh, you know, a yearling bull, he might be considered heifer safe, but his accuracy is only 0.2 or 0.25 from an EPD standpoint. And, and the very possible variation there is still just massive. So I think the older those bulls get, the more you know about them, uh, the better off you are. Um, not to say that there's not a place for yearling bulls, but um, as a, you know, as a personal preference, I think there's a, it just, it tells you a little more complete story, the older those critters get. Okay. So we've talked about the environment. We've talked about looking at your own herd and figuring out what you kind of need to change, what direction you're going, but what considerations need to be made with producers marketing plan before they select bulls? Well, you know, I think if you look back at when, when we were really in the in the thralls of the COVID pandemic and stuff like that. I mean, the box box beef premiums for some of these higher end carcasses were insane. They were absolutely crazy. Um, and I think, you know, as an industry, we are moving towards developing the beef segment as a premium product. Um, there's more choice in prime carcasses hitting the rail than there ever has been before, which is fantastic. You know, beef, beef producers are exceptional at taking it upon themselves listening to these market indicators and moving in a positive direction without, you know, without ever being mandated or, or um, forced to. And, you know, that's something that I think is going to, is going to stay around for a long time. You know, as this industry becomes a little more vertically integrated and you start to see some of those pressures come in, um, those premiums are just going to get, um, you know, it might, it might kind of end up like the BQA, 
um, boost when it first came out. If you were getting BQA certified, you used to be able to get a little bit of a premium. And when you look at that today, it's not necessarily a premium, but if you're not, you, you take the risk of being dinged. And so I think a lot of the, a lot of the old school mentalities of, you know, these calves just won't grade, but they're big enough. Uh, let's take them to the sale barn. I think those, those are the producers that run the risk of having challenges in the future. I think the, the industry is kind of, has kind of spoken the down, the downstream um, consumers have, have spoken that they enjoy quality beef. Um, especially when it's as expensive as it is today. Um, you really just kind of have to be paying attention to a lot of those things. Um, and you know, if, and if you just take your, if you take your calves to the sale barn, that's, that's totally fine. And don't know how they grade, how they, how well they marble. Um, you know, that's not necessarily detrimental, but if you do, and you can keep in contact with the people that are buying those cattle and understand if there's something that you need to be putting more emphasis on there through a, you know, through a grading, through a, through a marbling perspective, um, through a ribeye area standpoint, that's only going to open up your upside potential moving down the road. And if we ever do get to a point where you start to get dinged for a, a certain number of select carcasses or low low choice carcasses that's going to put you one set at one step ahead of the game and really increase you know how quickly you can you can step in there through a couple generations of mating decisions and and correct that problem and and remain very competitive within the space um along with you know the feedability that's that's huge when these cattle go to the feedlot and are on feed for upwards of 180 days sometimes i mean that's that's a massive amount of expense for the feedlot operators. And if they know and their cattle buyers know the quality of cattle that they're getting, that's just going to reward. That's just going to reward the people that are taking the initiative to understand the genetic capability of their, of their feeder cattle and uh, help establish long-term relationships with high quality, reputable feeders and buyers and kind of simplify the marketing if, um, if at all possible. And I think, you know, I think the further we get down the road, the more commonplace that's just going to start to become accepted. And the more, the more you can learn about your cattle now, the the earlier you can start to implement these, these decisions and, and start to figure that stuff out. Um, it, because it really is, you know, it, it, we're, we're moving away from the, the old school philosophy of, you know, someone's going to make the money on a set of cattle and then someone's going to lose money. I think we're, everything has just become so trackable and integrated and um, measurable from a feed out standpoint that, that quality cattle really are going to command a premium for, for as long as possible until that just becomes the standard. And the, the closer you are to, to meeting that, the, the better off you'll be in the long term. Okay. So kind of a big picture question or, and kind of some of your personal insight too, since you've been working with producers for a few years, what is the biggest mistake or missed opportunity you see cattle men and women make when it comes to selecting bulls? Um, well, SDSU actually did a survey back in the day. And one thing that I really would like to see people move away from is using, using the actual birth weight of a, of a bull and using, you know, the birth weight EPD, I think sometimes there's a little bit too much emphasis put on that, especially when you're, when you're running up here in the Northern Plains, I mean, the environmental impact that, that can be, um, that can impact some of those things is just, it's huge. And, you know, that's something that we can immediately stop, stop putting so much emphasis on using a more complete picture like calving ease um that takes into all and takes into account a lot more variables and factors um that's that's really something that i think the the industry kind of needs to get back to our roots on is developing cattle that that will work on their own and work for the producers that are having to cab them out um you know reproduction is no matter which way you you measure it having a live calf is the most important thing that you can do as a producer um the next step beyond that is to make sure that they're having those calves. You're developing a bull battery and a breeding system management plan that provides you to form uniform, consistent lots of, 
of feeder cattle moving forward. Um, you know, that's appreciated at the sale barn. That's appreciated by, by backgrounded calf buyers. That's appreciated at the feedlot from a management and simplicity of, of feeding style. Um, you know, really putting, uh, putting emphasis on developing live calves, but also developing them in the way that we're not calving for 90, a hundred days. We're, we're doing it in a consolidated, calculated way that, that produces nice, pretty uniform lots that, that are going to really going to make someone's eyebrow go up when they see them walk in, you know, that's, that's something that, um, we did a pretty big research study, um, through SDSU that, that, I mean, maybe you call that anecdotal evidence, but you can hear the whisper start when one of those nice, nice sets of cattle walk in and the auctioneer sees it immediately, calls it out for everybody. And then to, to no one's surprise in the barn, they go for 20 cents over the average that day. You know what I mean? That's just something it's those little things that, that can help increase a producer's competitiveness in the market. All right. Well, I appreciate all your insight and uh, the advice that you've shared with my listeners today. So thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, this has been good. It's good to get back and stretch the speaking, speaking legs a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm a big podcast guy. I think there's some really good ones out there. I've listened to a few of yours and they're, they're great. You find some good quality guests and, you know, it's, it's a good way for producers to kind of get away from just reading it in a, reading it in a magazine or, you know, listening to coffee shop talk and do it in a fun way that, that is hopefully beneficial. I mean, that's what we're, we're all trying to do here. So. Absolutely. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.